the wellness revolution starts now. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Hoetze. We have today as our guest, Dr. Michael Hollick. Dr. Hollick is a professor of medicine, physiology, and biophysics, and a director of clinical research at Boston University Medical Center. Dr. Hollick is the leading authority on vitamin D in the entire country. This has been part of his life's work for the last 50 years and I want to introduce you to Dr. Hollick, and thank you, Dr. Hollick, for joining us today. Vitamin D is a very essential uh, element, uh, nutrient in our body that enables us to maintain good health, helps prevent cancer, helps build a healthy immune system, helps build good cardiovascular function. And Dr. Hollick has been involved with the research in vitamin D since he was a graduate student um, several years ago. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to bring him on because we are very strong advocates of vitamin D here at the Hotsi Health and Wellness Center, and I wanted you to meet Dr. Hollick, and I wanted him to explain how he got interested in vitamin D as a graduate student and what that led to and get his uh, – get his perspective on the importance of vitamin D. So, Dr. Hollick, welcome to Dr. Hotsey Report. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, tell us about tell us about your work as a graduate student. Where were you working? How in the world did you get involved with vitamin D? So, I applied to the graduate program in biochemistry at the University of Wisconsin. And back then, DNA had just been discovered, and I was really excited about really kind of getting into um, understanding a little bit more about DNA and how it might relate to, to disease processes. But at the time, many of the mentors at the biochemistry department already had graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. And so they suggested that I meet with Dr. Hector DeLuca, who was working in vitamin D. And so my response was, why do I want to work in vitamin D? It sounded to me like a very boring subject because we knew about vitamin D deficiency in rickets and you give vitamin D and prevent rickets, but who cares after that? And, but I was told that, you know, this is your opportunity. And so I took it and little did I know that made a sow's ear into a golden purse. And so for my master's degree, I was responsible for identifying the major circulating form of vitamin D in human blood known as 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and ultimately helped to develop the first clinically useful assays for it. For my PhD, I was responsible uh, working with Dr. DeLuca and Dr. Heinrich Schnoes for the identification of the active form of vitamin D made by your kidneys, known as 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. As an undergraduate, I had a degree in chemistry, and I had a special interest in organic chemistry. So my roommate and I, when I was a postdoc, started the first chemical synthesis of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D3, and we succeeded. And that material that we had made in the test tube was given to patients with kidney failure who had bone disease, because it finally began to be realized that patients with kidney disease that have bone disease and vitamin D resistance, the reason is that they couldn't activate vitamin D. So we made the active form of vitamin D, we gave it to nephrologists who treated their patients, and patients that were wheelchair bound, had severe bone pain, started walking again, and had dramatic improvement in their bone health. So that was my first introduction into translational medicine. And then I went off to Massachusetts General Hospital, where I did my residency, um, and then became assistant professor at Harvard in the endocrine section under Dr. John T. Potts. Well, so uh, tell us about this. Uh, the question comes up or the comments come up, is vitamin, D, uh, is vitamin D really a vitamin or is it a hormone? Well, by definition, it's a hormone, right? Because you make it in your skin when you're exposed to sunlight or if you ingest it in your diet, it requires it 
to get activated first in your liver to 25 hydroxy vitamin D, and then in your kidneys to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And then it goes to a distant organ, the intestine, and tells the intestine to increase the efficiency of absorption of dietary calcium. So by definition, it's a hormone. Okay, so tell us the importance of vitamin D in good health. What parts of the body, and obviously it's going to affect all the body, but in particular, what is the beneficial effects of vitamin D on our, on our, um, on the human body system? So, bottom line, in my opinion, is that you need vitamin D from birth until death. We now recognize that essentially every cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor, i.e., that it recognizes the active form of vitamin D. And Which so is vitamin D, is, is that the vitamin D3? So it doesn't matter. So vitamin D2 comes from yeast or from mushrooms exposed to sunlight. Vitamin D3 comes from oily fish like salmon, mackerel, herring, and cod liver oil, um, and is available as a supplement uh, and is often used in fortification of foods in many countries. But India, for example, fortifies their food with vitamin D2 because of um, many are vegans and will not take vitamin D3. I see. So, uh, the, so is D, which is the active form? Is it D2 or D3? Sorry. So vitamin D2 is vitamin D2, and vitamin D3 is vitamin D3. They both are recognized by the liver. They're converted to their counterparts, 25-hydroxy vitamin D2, 25-hydroxy vitamin D3. They then go to the kidney, and they're converted to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D2, the active form of D2, or 125-dihydroxy vitamin D3, which is the active form of D3. Ah, so uh, what is the best way for an individual to increase their vitamin D level? And what do you find in your patients? Do you find most patients, you're up in Boston, I wouldn't expect this to be a, a good levels of vitamin D, but what do you find in the patients that you see their vitamin D levels? Well, we've done a study and many others have done similar studies. Basically worldwide, 40% of the population is vitamin D deficient, 60% deficient or insufficient. And that includes most in the United States. And it doesn't matter whether you live in Florida or in Boston, it's the same problem. Because the major source of vitamin D for humans thousands of years ago was sun exposure. And of course, we don't have an opportunity to do that very often. And um, there's essentially no vitamin D in your diet. Like I said, oily fish, like salmon, contains about 500 to 1,000 units in a serving of 3.5 ounces. And mushrooms exposed to sunlight. Cod liver oil contains about 400 units of vitamin D. Per and what? Per a tablespoon? Per a tablespoon, yep. And, um, and then milk, for example, is fortified with vitamin D, but there's only 100 units in 8 ounces. Orange juice is fortified with vitamin D. We actually did the seminal study for that. Um, that got the um, approval uh, had, contains 100 units of vitamin D. Well, that's a sur- that, that just didn't sufficient at all, is it, to get your vitamin right. D levels up to a good right. level? Because the endocrine society practice guidelines recommends infants require 400 to 1,000 units a day, children 600 to 1,000 units a day, adults 1,500 to 2,000 units a day. And if you're obese, you need two to three times more. Now, doctor, in our, in our experience, and by the way, the reason, folks, most Americans are low in vitamin D is because we spend time indoors. I mean, it may be, and even when we go out of doors, we slather ourselves with all, all sorts of uh, lotions or creams that block the ultraviolet light, which converts cholesterol in your blood, in your skin, and converts it to vitamin D. Vitamin D. And that's why we call vitamin D a hormone, because cholesterol is a building block for all your, your uh, adrenal and sex hormones are made from cholesterol. They're steroids. That's where we get the word steroid from, cholesterol. 
Well, vitamin D is made from cholesterol, and it's well, it's made from the precursor of cholesterols, known as seven D hydrocholesterol. And so the sunlight converts converts that into vitamin D. So in in that sense, it truly is a it truly is a hormone because it's derived from cholesterol or or a, or a, a precursor of, of of cholesterol. So when we say uh, when we say people have either insufficient or low sufficient levels of vitamin D, what ranges do you look at? What are the ranges in uh, on the labs that you look at to con- uh, where you consider in a normal range where the optimal range is. Right. So the Endocrine Society practice guidelines that came out in 2011 that makes recommendations for healthcare professionals worldwide recommends the following is vitamin D deficiency is a blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D of less than 20 nanograms per ml. Insufficiency 21 to 29 nanograms per ml. And vitamin D sufficiency, 30 nanograms per ml, and up to 100 is considered to be perfectly safe. The Endocrine Society further recommended to guarantee sufficiency because of the vagaries of assays that are out there, that a good range, preferred range, is 40 to 60 nanograms per ml for 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Now, this is the Endocrine Society, uh, and uh, while I appreciate their recommendations, in our experience and from what I've read, you really need to keep your levels above the level of 70, somewhere between 70 and 100 to really have optimal levels. And um, to get those levels, we found you, you can't do it on two, you can't do it on 2,000 international units a day. For what it's worth, I take 30,000 international units a day, and I barely get up in, you know, 70, 80, maybe I can get 90 occasionally. And not everybody can take that. You've got to measure your vitamin D. Some people absorb it very well. Some people don't absorb it very well. And I can't explain. Maybe it's because I'm 71 and I don't absorb as well as I would if I were 50. But uh, our experience has been we have to get people on a – I would say our average is 10,000 international units a day to get people to bump up into the 70 range. What are your thoughts on that? So two thoughts. The first is that contrary to what people thought, aging has no effect on vitamin D absorption. Good. It turns out that some people have lower blood levels for the same amount of vitamin D intake because it depends on an enzyme called the 24-hydroxylase that helps to regulate that blood level. And some people have more active or less active um, uh, form of it. And so as a result, the blood levels can be different, even being on the same Same amount for different individuals. Right. The second is, I think that the 40 to 60 nanogram per ml range is reasonable. And by the way, the, for your audience to know, I chaired that committee for the Endocrine Society. So right. I went through all the literature, right? And I think that up to 100 is perfectly safe. Um, but in my opinion, there aren't really good data out there to demonstrate that 70 or 80 or 90 makes any difference than 40 to 60. Right. We did a study, however, in... Um, healthy adults, where we gave them 600, 4,000, or 10,000 units a day for a period of six months and asked the question, what is the gene expression? What's going on in their immune cells when you're on these doses of vitamin D? And what we did find dramatically is that on 600 units a day, the amount of genes being regulated was about 150 genes. On 4,000 units a day, a little over 300 genes. But on 10,000 units a day, over 1,200 genes were up and down regulated in the immune system. So there may be something to increasing your vitamin D intake, you know, in higher levels. Those individuals had blood levels in the range of 70 to 90 nanograms per ml. I personally take 6,000 units every day. And my blood level is about 72 nanograms per ml. Well, you do well on absorption. <laughs> I have to take so it's not absorption. It's really metabolism. Metabolism. We're and, right. Well, you do well on 
I guess I just don't, my, my system just <laughs> doesn't do it that well, unfortunately. That's why I have to take more. And that's why it's important for you, l- ladies and gentlemen, to get your vitamin D levels checked. Because you may think you're taking adequate amounts of vitamin D, and really you're not. Your levels may be in a very low range. My feeling is I always like to be, you know, my philosophy is always being an optimal range, optimum range. And if the range is between 30 and 100, I want to be on the top end. I always wanted to be at the top end of my class. That's just the way I operate. I'm kind of an all-or-nothing guy. That doesn't mean that's necessarily necessarily right, but it, it's worked well for me over the last, uh, golly, uh, 20 or 30 years that I've been taking vitamin D. And uh, I'm still active, healthy, and, uh, you know, Lord willing, I'll, I'll live a much longer life. Could kill over dead tomorrow. Who knows? Nobody's going to ever say that Dr. Hotsey lingered. I'll guarantee you that because I'm not doing that. But uh, so on. So let's talk about uh, your experience with conventional medicine. Now, you obviously, because of your wonderful work in really figuring out vitamin D and and how it was metabolized, how important it was for different organs of the body, and every cell in the body is it was important for. Um, over, it's really you know most conventional doctors are not proponents of vitamins or minerals, so you must have met some resistance early on as you tried to explain the benefits of vitamin. Explain that to me and how you overcame that. You're correct that um, even in 2004, I had written a book called The UV Advantage, trying to make the public aware of the vitamin D deficiency problem. And the fact that, yes, if you use a sunscreen with an SPF of 30, we showed it reduces your ability to make vitamin D in your skin by about 97.5%. And so it is important um, for everyone to realize that there are essentially no dietary sources of vitamin D. And as a result, essentially everyone is at risk of vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency. And there are a multitude of studies that have associated many chronic illnesses with vitamin D deficiency and insufficiency. Okay, explain those illnesses, what they are. Well, for example, like I said, from birth, right, we're now recognizing that Women who are pregnant and vitamin D deficient are at higher risk of having the most serious complication, preeclampsia. We also showed in over 200 women at our hospital, those that were vitamin D deficient at a higher risk of requiring a cesarean section. There's evidence to suggest that if in utero, if the infant is not exposed to any vitamin D in utero and vitamin D deficient, they're more likely to have dental caries early in life, increased risk for wheezing disorders, and asthma. So there's a lot of benefit for pregnant women to improve their vitamin D status. There is also good evidence that vitamin D deficiency during childhood may increase risk for type 1 diabetes throughout the rest of your life. A study was done in Finland showing that Infants getting 2,000 units a day during their first year of life, followed for the next 31 years, reduced their risk of getting type 1 diabetes by 88%. Hmm. There's other evidence to suggest that if you live above Atlanta, Georgia, for the first 10 years of your life, you have 100% increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis for the rest of your life, no matter where you live uh, on this planet. And a study done out of Harvard showed that that those individuals that had the highest intake of vitamin D reduced their risk of developing multiple sclerosis by more than 40%. What about cancer? So there are studies to show that colorectal cancer um, could potentially be reduced substantially. Um, The Garland brothers back in the 1990s began to suggest even just improving your vitamin D status by a thousand units a day could reduce risk of colorectal cancer by uh, as much as 50%. A study out of the nurses' health study out of Harvard showed nurses that had the highest intake of vitamin D reduced their risk of acquiring breast cancer by more than 40%. What about heart disease? So there is good evidence um, that your cardiovascular system have receptors for vitamin D. 
and help to regulate blood pressure, help to regulate your your heart function. Um, and there are studies, including one from the Framingham Heart Study, that showed that those patients that had a blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D of less less than 15 nanograms per ml had almost a 50% higher risk of having a heart attack. And um, tell us about the benefits of vitamin D on the immune system. We have done now several studies to show that you definitely alter immune function by increasing your vitamin D intake. We also know that the macrophages, those kind of Pac-Men and women in your blood right. that gobble up infectious agents, they metabolize vitamin D. They activate vitamin D. And why do they do that? Because once it's activated within that cell, it tells the cell to make a protein called cathalocidin, which helps to lyse infectious agents like bacteria and viruses. And so there is evidence to suggest that improvement in vitamin D status improves your immune function and helps to fight infection. And finally, bone health. So vitamin D is critically important for bone health because it is the only hormone that tells your intestine to efficiently absorb dietary calcium. And so if you're not getting enough calcium from your diet to be able to help maintain your bone structure, the body cares about your blood calcium. And as a result, it starts to steal it out of your bones and helps to cause loss of bone, including ultimately increasing risk for osteoporosis and fracture. So vitamin D is very important for bone health. We can say from Dr. Hollick's great studies over the decades that vitamin D must be an essential part of your daily supplement program. And I want to encourage you to take a regular dose of vitamin C, get your levels measured by your physician, and get your vitamin D level up to help with bone health, to help with cardiovascular function, to help with your immune system, and a host of other uh, uh, systems in the body. Did you know that pharmacists are considered the most accessible healthcare professionals, and yet at the same time, we are generally the most underutilized? Pharmacists are medication experts, which means that we can best advise you on the safe and appropriate use of your medications, when to take them and how to take them. We're experts in pharmacology, which means that we receive extensive training to understand the science behind how medications work within the body. We screen for any interactions which may occur between the medications you're taking, and we have an in-depth understanding of how these medications affect each system of the body. Your body is unique, which means that the type and dose of medication you take should also be unique. We want you to know that at Physicians Preference Pharmacy, we are always available to you and we welcome your questions. We're with Dr. Michael Hollick. Dr. Hollick is a professor of medicine, physiology, and biophysics at uh, Boston University Medical Center. Of course, that's in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Hollick, over the last 50 years, has been a leader, in fact, the leader in the research into vitamin D and its huge effects that it has on numerous systems in the body, including uh, the immune system, the cardiovascular system, our bones, uh, and a host of other uh, a host of other organs in the body. Because vitamin D is required, every cell in the body, from the top of your head to the bottom of your toe, has got a receptor for vitamin D. And Dr. Hollick is the one that researched and learned what vitamin D was the vitamin D that worked and what benefits it had. And then he had to sell it to uh, the conventional medicine doctors around the country who historically have never promoted vitamins and minerals in, uh, in the treatment or prevention of disease. So Dr. Hollick, let me go to that question first. You, as a young doctor, uh, first as a graduate student and then as a young doctor, as you studied uh, vitamin D and were excited about the results that you had uh, and were exuberant and were telling other doctors about it, tell us about, tell us about your initial response and how you personally were able to overcome all the pushback that you received and how were you finally able to get physicians to 
admit that vitamin D is a very essential part of the diet and how important it is for good health? So I think that um, I, after I completed my residency at Massachusetts General Hospital, I, I then asked the fundamental question, which was how do you make vitamin D in your skin and what factors regulate? And so for the next decade, I started to realize time of day, season, latitude, degree of skin pigmentation, sunscreen use, all impact. To give you an example, you basically cannot make any vitamin D before nine o'clock in the morning and very little after three o'clock in the afternoon, even in the summertime at the equator because of the zenith angle of the sun. We know, for example, if you live above Atlanta, Georgia, you basically cannot make any significant amount of vitamin D from about November until next March. And so realizing this and realizing that there's essentially no vitamin D in your diet, I began to suggest that maybe vitamin D deficiency is a major health issue. And initially, of course, it went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> because everybody assumed that if you have a healthy diet, that you're getting all the nutrients that you need, not realizing that Mother Nature had designed us early in evolution to get our vitamin D from sun exposure. And so there was a lot of pushback for the recommendation of sensible sun exposure and vitamin D supplementation. And my feeling was that science ultimately wins out. And so I continued to do basic and clinical research and began to realize as early as the mid 1980s that your skin cells not only can make vitamin D, but they had a vitamin D receptor. And I wanted to know why. And we went on to show that when we grew skin cells in culture and added the active form of vitamin D, it regulated their cell growth. So I put my- I'm MD sorry, hat regulated on. their what? Cell growth. Oh, I got you. Their, their proliferative activity. Right. So I put my MD hat back on and I asked the question, what skin disorder is out there that is hyperproliferative, non-malignant, that maybe you could use the active form of vitamin D for? And the answer was psoriasis. So I introduced the concept of using activated vitamin D topically to treat psoriasis and demonstrated its efficacy. And it is now one of the line, first line treatments for psoriasis for people that have only moderate disease on their elbows and knees, for example. And so back around 2006, all of a sudden, there seemed to be more interest in vitamin D. Many more publications were coming out. Literally tens of thousands of publications are starting to come out on vitamin D. And by 2010, the Institute of Medicine came out with its new recommendations for vitamin D. And in 2011, the Endocrine Society came out with its new recommendations. And it's, be, and it's continued to be on a steep slope of, of um, int increased interest worldwide for a wide variety of um, disorders. You, you know, Dr. Hollick, the story goes, when somebody comes up with a new innovative idea, everybody around him goes like, yeah, there's Hollick again and his vitamin D. You know, he's crazy. That's all he thinks about. It's the only thing he sees. He sees as a panacea for everything. You know, he's some kind of kook, you know. You know, and we just, and they smile at you and, you know, you'd feel their uh, their uh, disapprobation. And you would, you know, and then all of a sudden studies start showing things. And, they, and you know, first they laugh at you and then they mock you. And then next thing the studies come out and then, you know, 10, 20, 30 years later it becomes obvious that, you were completely right. And of course, every, and they go like, well, of course, everybody knew vitamin D was important. You know, we've been using it for records for years. Of course, that was right. And they act like they invented the whole idea. When you really, and, and, and I know this from having read about you, you're the guy that, that was the point of the spear on this whole movement to get people to take vitamin D. And I want to commend you for that because I know it's not easy to be the lone, you know, you're a lone wolf out there. You're the maverick. And uh, doctors tend to want to fall in some orthodox uh, uh, conventional realm. They don't want to buck the system, and they don't want to be seen as, you know, someone that's different than everybody else. That's just the way human nature is. I don't care whether you have an MD behind your name or you never went to high school. People are the same. They like, have a herd mentality, and they don't like to be different. And I really commend you for being a maverick in this field because you have absolutely saved the lives of literally 
you've got to be it's hundreds of millions of people because of your research uh, taking vitamin D. And I, I really commend you for that, and I thank you for it. And I want all our listeners to appreciate the work of Dr. Hollick. It is tremendous work that he's did, and he faced a lot of uh, uh, opposition in bringing this to the forefront. Now everybody goes, yeah, he was right all the time. Yeah, we knew that all the time, and we love him, and he's honored everywhere. But uh, you had to hang in there to get to get where you got, and so I want to commend you, and I thank you for your work, sir. Thank you for your kind words. And uh, so let's let's talk about we, the immune system. Everybody now is starting to realize, except for a few like Fauci and and uh, Bill Gates and others, that the immune system is really God's means for us to live healthy lives and to be able to fight off all kinds of pathogens that we come in contact every day. Folks, let me remind you, we are, born in a, we are born in a sea of germs. When you were born, you came through your mother's birth canal and were covered with billions of germs in her birth canal. And uh, these are bacteria, and they worked their way down into your gut, and they populated your intestines and gave you normal, healthy, autochthonous bacteria that helps you digest your food. Your body is covered with bacteria from the tip of your head to the bottom of your toe. You're covered with staph- Staphylococcus epidermis trillions of, of those, and they're in your in your oropharynx, in your mouth, in your uh, intestine. You're loaded with virus and bacteria everywhere you go, every tabletop, every doorknob. The dog that jumps up in your bed at night and licks you on the face, been licking some places, you shouldn't have him lick your face after he licked. You, you're around germs all the time. <clears throat> we and the reason we don't die from germs is because God has given us an immune system. That immune system is meant to attack pathogenic or dangerous bacteria and viruses that come in and and develop an immunity to them. So when we're exposed to them sometime in the future, we fight it off. In order to have a healthy immune system, you've got to have several things in place. One, you've got to have a good diet in place. Healthy eating habits are very important. Cut your simple carbs out. Get your sugars, uh, get the sugar out of your diet, particularly the wheat products, uh, corn, potatoes, and rice. Uh, cut your sugars down; they're highly inflammatory, and uh, they suppress the immune system. Second thing you need to do: get your hormones balanced. As you age, your hormone levels go down. That's why women look frumpy and men look, men get grumpy. Our hormone levels, testosterone, female hormones, all the kind, tes- and thyroid hormones are adversely affected as we age by the decline in our other hormones, and and that governs our metabolism. And then vitamins and minerals and nutrients are very important. And one of the most essential vitamins, uh, which is really a hormone that's important for good immune system health, and this is the research that Dr. Hollick's work on, is vitamin D. Now, we, we know over the last 18, 20 months, 22 months, uh, we've been exposed to a fear mongering about a virus that came out of China, and it, it's the uh, uh, COVID-19 virus. And that has caused a host of health problems in people and caused fear to be created, in which I really believe Dr. Hollick, the whole thing was to create fear, panic, and mass hysteria so they could literally uh, gain control, power, and money from this whole situation. The people that are making a fortune out of this if you would have invested in Pfizer stock or Moderna, you could be rich right now. They're making a fortune uh, off their uh, their uh, bioweapon injection that they're giving you. But in what well, we told our patients here at the OC Health and Wellness Center, if you want to be healthy, uh, you've got to keep your immune system healthy. So we have an immune pack, which contains vitamin D, and we have 10,000 international units of vitamin D in our immune pack. And we, out of 6,500 guests, active guests here at the OCA Health and Wellness Center, we've had less than 400 that have called in with any type of upper respiratory viral syndrome at all. Uh, we put none of our guests in the hospital, not recommended. They've all survived. Some, in, some 85 years old got over it in three days. And we do use, by the way, we're like Zelenko, we use... Uh, we use uh, hydroxychloroquine, we use ivermectin, we use budesimide, we use cortisol, we use z All of our patients have stayed out of the hospital. We've had 85-year-olds get over it in three days. We have some 40-year-old that, you know, t- once it gets in the lungs, it takes two, three weeks to get over it. Uh, but I think our patients have done exceptionally well because we've had them on vitamin D, among other vitamins and minerals. 
So with that long soliloquy, I, I, I throw it back into your court about vitamin D and its effect on the immune system in dealing with these upper respiratory, these viruses, the flu, flu virus with the coronavirus, among others. Tell us about what your what you have any findings on that. So I think that we're beginning to realize that vitamin D is an important immunomodulator. And so when COVID first started um, back in March of um, 2020, that it started um, to gain a lot of attention, um, I instantly um, realized that maybe if you're vitamin D deficient, you're at increased risk of acquiring the infection. And so working with Quest Diagnostics, uh, we looked at 191,000 COVID positive patients throughout the entire United States um, and all ethnicities, ages, and found that if you had a blood level greater than uh, between 20 um, versus th- greater than 34 nanograms per ml, it reduced your risk of acquiring the infection by more than 50%. We then did another study where we um, asked the question, patients coming in with severe infection into an Iranian hospital, looking at their blood level of 25 hydroxy D, and then to follow their outcome, we reported that there was a marked reduced risk for many of the complications associated with COVID and a 54.5% reduced risk of dying from the infection if the blood level was at least 40 nanograms per ml for those that were 40 years and older who had been dying from the infection. We did another study at our hospital and asked the same question. And we found that those, no matter what their age, as long as they had normal weight and they had a vitamin D status that was consistent with being vitamin D sufficient, it reduced their risk of morbidity and mortality. There are several other studies that basically confirm these observations. So there is good evidence. There are association studies that suggest that improvement in vitamin D status can reduce risk for acquiring the infection And if you do have the infection, reducing the complications associated with it, including possibly reducing the cytokine storm, because vitamin D is playing a critical role in immunomodulation. Now, that's that's a very important point. And most people don't understand the cytokine storm. And that's where your immune system begins to attack the cells that have been invaded by a virus and they secrete certain chemicals that are called cytokines that are highly inflammatory. And basically what they're trying to do is kill off the virus, but having to kill off the cells, your NK cell, killer cells will go after the cells that are invaded and they're going to whack them. So I like to explain it like this. When people get this cytokine reaction, which predominantly occurs within the lungs, I think this particular spike protein, while it has adverse effects uh, across the entire body, it, it, it's, it's pronounced in the lungs. This is what our experience has been. If you get, if you are not treated uh, for early in the course of the disease and it gets down in your lungs, you've got about a two-week course. It's a rough course, and it takes time to get over it. And what happens is that your lung cells literally get burnt. Think about it like that. Just as if you put your hand in a fireplace when the fire was on and it got burnt, your, your skin's going to end up uh, blistering and you're going to get, and then the blisters are going to pop and or after several days and you're going to get scabbing and you're going to get swelling and, and all the inflammation that lasts two to three weeks before that skin heals. It's the same thing that happens in the lungs when you have the cytokine storms. And what <clears throat> Dr. Hollick is saying is that one thing that may modulate your immune system and prevent from you from having an overreaction where you produce a, a very strong cytokine storm in your lungs can be the use of vitamin D3. It's been shown in studies, the studies that Dr. Hollick has done in studies around the world, that the higher level of vitamin D3 uh, 
patients that had that had a much better course of the disease, had milder symptoms. If they were hospitalized, had a higher chance of surviving than those individuals that had low levels of vitamin D. And I would, it'd be really interesting <clears throat> to, and I don't know if you can do it in your studies, to see at what levels, you know, you're saying above 40 people, you know, had a higher survival level, but I wonder what is, wonder if, what, what the survival level of people that was above 50 nanograms and of 60 and 70, and just wonder if what level, if, if there was any change, did you all see that as the level got higher, there was a higher survival rate, or did you all even look at that individually and just simply look at a, a number above or below 40? No, we actually looked at um, every level. And, and what we could say statistically, that there was a statistical difference um, for infectivity if you're less than 20 or greater than 34. But if you look at our publication that is free online, you'll see that that benefit continues to improve with higher levels. It's just not, not statistically significant. And so, yes, we've looked at higher levels and it does appear that there continues to be a trend um, for improvement. But again, statistically, not significant. Now here, now you did this at, 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 at where Boston University Medical Center is. This where you are you? Of course, your study was done through the lab with 191,000 patients state uh, nationwide. It, it's your hospital at Boston University Medical Center. Are they using vitamin D with the patients that come in with COVID or uh, COVID uh, COVID nineteen infections? Not to my knowledge. Now, why is that? I mean, I think that, you know, the issue is that it's a vitamin. And so I, I don't think that, you know, the medical community has taken it seriously, even though I think most of the vitamin D experts agree that vitamin D does play an important role in your immune system and in modulating your immune system in a healthy way. This, I mean, this is what makes me, this is what outrages me about these doctors. These are the same type of doctors that drove Semmelweis out of practice back in Austria in the 1800s when he suggested, hey guys, we may be giving preparal sepsis to all these female patients in the hospital because we don't wash our hands after we do cadaver studies. They stripped him of his license. They threw him out, went to Hungary. Of course, you know the rest of the story but they ostracized him because he had the gall to suggest that physicians needed to wash their hands before they delivered babies. You know the story of that. And so here you are, you've done this masterful work and shown over the over your 50 years of study the dramatic effects of vitamin D. And we've got a disease which is, which can, if you, if, now mind you, Folks, the COVID-19 infection is not the end of the world. It's not the plague. For crying out loud in a bucket, 99.9% .9 of the people survive who get it, and only about 30% of the population even has a demonstrable disease of any kind, mild to severe. And those that have it, 50%, those who have it and die are over 80, over 80 uh, 50% are over 80 years in age, 50% living in nursing homes, and they have at least almost four uh, coexisting medical conditions, diabetes, overweight, cor coronary artery disease. They've had strokes. They've got dementia. They've got kidney problems. Those are the people that go to nursing homes. People don't go to nursing homes because they're going to be rehabilitated and healthy. It's the, uh, it's the waiting room for the afterlife. Uh, and people live there an average two and a half years. When you go to a nursing home, your average life expectancy is really less than two and a half years. So it's not, un it's not to be unexpected that when people go to nursing homes, they die of disease, and usually it's the flu or some kind of pneumonia. That's what happens. But in the general population, if you want to stay healthy, I want to encourage you to follow the recommendations of Dr. Hollick, and that's to get on a good vitamin D supplement program and we use here vitamin D3. I guess that's what you use, or vitamin D2. What do you recommend? So either is perfectly fine. I've, uh, the pharmaceutical form available in the United States is vitamin D2. And the reason is that it predated the FDA. 
And so no one ever got the pharmaceutical approval for vitamin D3. But vitamin D3, of course, is what you make in your skin and is available as a supplement right. by supplement manufacturers. And so most people take vitamin D3 because it is the major supplement available in the United States, which is perfectly fine. But vitamin D2 is equally fine, in my opinion. Well, doctor, thank you for being here and giving us your update and your perspective on the benefits and the essential nature of use of vitamin D3 or vitamin D2 to help improve your overall health. Thank you, Dr. Hollick. My pleasure. Have a delightful day. Information provided on this program is neither intended nor implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice and is not intended to replace the services of a physician, nor does it constitute a doctor-patient relationship. You should not use information from this radio program to diagnose or treat a health problem or disease without consulting with a qualified health care provider. If you have or suspect you have an urgent medical problem, promptly contact a professional health care provider or call 911. Dr. Hotze's Wellness Revolution Advice advises you to always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider prior to starting any new treatment or with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Any application of the recommendations from this program is at the listener's discretion.